Uh, hi. So I am a, I'm using this um, spirit as a scientist, and these are the beautiful creatures that my team and I study. So we study networks and the patterns between nodes and how they, um, how they connect. And what I'm going to tell you is how I got so intrigued by them in the first place at the beginning of my scientific career, how we use them today to try to help children with severe genetic diseases, and how I also imagine that they will be useful in the future and have the potential really to revolutionize the way we do uh, medicine and, and science in general. So let me introduce you to the, the basic um, idea why we think that studying networks is, is something useful to begin with, with this um, beautiful design object from the year 1990 that is a Macintosh classic, and this is what it looks like if you take it apart. And already from this picture, I think it's pretty clear that if you only know the components of such a complex system, even like a computer, you are not going to be able to fully understand how the system works, and you're also not going to be able to repair it if something is broken. And the one crucial component that is missing is how these bits and pieces are actually fit together. So how are they wired? And this is only an example of a small part of this computer, and that is the, the chip that actually does the computations. So the promise of doing science of networks is that by staring long enough at these wiring diagrams and at the structures that we see there, we can learn something deep about how the systems that they represent really work. Now this map is relatively ordered and tidy. Um, the maps that I actually study, I study cells and the human body, are much more messy, and this is how they look like. So, this is a still frame from the video that you, that you saw in the beginning, and this is, in a way, a map of a human cell. So the nodes that you see here, these are proteins, little um, biomolecules, well, not so little, biomolecules or molecular machines, and essentially everything we do from digesting food to moving our muscle to fighting infections is on the molecular level the result of um, biomolecules like this interacting with each other. So what we as network scientists do is we try to make sense of this um, pretty mess and we try to bring order and see patterns and structure and ultimately um, see how the connection is to the systems that they represent. So when I started at the beginning after I studied physics and I was wondering what to do next, and this was right about the time when um, the first of these maps actually emerged. So um, researchers had done the painstaking work of really connect, of collecting all these intellect, um, interactions that are happening in a cell and around the same time, also very different maps were emerging. So people were also starting to um, measure how computers are wired together in the internet, or how neurons are wired in the brain, or how people are connecting in, in a social setting. And the fantastic finding of the, the pioneers of this field was that all of these networks are on a very deep structural level actually very, very similar. As one example, is this network, that we are moving from the tiny little microscopic network of the proteins interacting in our cell to the largest infrastructure that humanity has built, and that is a map of the Internet. So the nodes that you see here are um, servers. These would be large computers, essentially, and there are lines between them if they send and receive data from one to another. So if you imagine that you are, let's say, watching a TEDx video on YouTube, what really happens is that um, the video will travel from the server where it is actually stored, probably some Google server, through a number of steps until it reaches your provider and your phone. And what this network that is working on an entirely different scale and the cellular network and the brain network and many, many other networks have in common is, for example, that the vast majority of the nodes in this and other networks have only relatively few connections. Most people on Facebook have only not so many friends. Most servers here would only um, communicate with few other computers, and also in our brain, the most cells are actually not so well connected. On the other side, there are also what we would call super hubs. So on the right side, you see this um, bright flowery structure, or there's, there's another one on the left side. And these are nodes that are extremely well connected, so that um, spread out their connections throughout the entire network, in a social network, you could think of Kim Kardashian or in a, in a website that would be Google. And this has important consequences for how these systems work or what also happens, how you can damage them. 
And what we as network scientists, again, try to do is to understand how did these similarities emerge between these entirely different systems, and how can we understand by looking at one network also other networks. So what happens, how fast can information spread, for example, in a network? Or how can I damage it or how can I repair it? And to illustrate you how we try to make this connection between network structure and what they represent, let's have a look at the largest social network that there is. So Facebook, where the nodes are, well, you and me, most of you, I imagine. And links in this network represent Facebook friendship. And what is already visually immediately obvious is that you see how the continents emerge from this map. And that is pretty straightforward. It's, there are not too many people living in the Atlantic Ocean, so there is not too much light there, not too many Facebook users. But there are also other holes. So there are other geographical holes. You can see the Sahara, you can see the Amazon basin, um, but there are also political holes. So you can see that there is relatively dark in China and in Russia, or economical ones, let's say um, parts of Africa, where in principle there would be a lot more people living there um, than have access to an, a technology like Facebook. Now, in this example, we know all this, right? I mean, we know that there are continents that have different political and economical status, but the promise is that if you look at a system like the cell that we, in fact, do not understand very well, that by studying very closely how the components of the cell interact with each other, we can um, learn something also deep about how the cell works. Another metaphor, let's say, that has been guiding our work over the last couple of years is to take this notion of a map and transport it to these networks. And to illustrate that, I like to use the most iconic map there is, the one of uh, New York City. And the three key components that are relevant to our work would be the following. The first one is that location matters. So without knowing the numbers, I imagine that, well, it's pretty straightforward to guess that the Starbucks at Times Square sells a lot more coffee than the Starbucks on Roosevelt Island. And I actually checked there is a Starbucks on Roosevelt Island. So location is important. The second important concept is the one of neighborhoods. So if you compare, let's say, Wall Street to the beautiful area uh, of Williamsburg in Brooklyn, these two neighborhoods have very different functions and are frequented by a very different clientele, I imagine. And the third one is that distance matters on these maps. So I'm, without being a political scientist, I imagine that it is no coincidence that the richest part of Wall Street is maximally removed from the poorest neighborhood in New York City um, up there in the Bronx. So how do we translate this to these molecular networks where, again, the nodes are, are molecules, are proteins, and the interactions are that they actually do bind in our cell? The first one, we found that also location matters in these networks. So if you compare um, these um, red genes in the middle that are very highly connected, that are very central, they more often than not are also part of essential molecular machines that are so important that if you have a mutation in one of these components, you would typically these would be lethal. Or sometimes they can be associated with very severe inborn diseases. Whereas these genes that are more at the periphery and less um, strongly connected are often redundant and mutations in these genes would have an effect that is a lot less dramatic. Also the concept of neighborhood turns out to be important and meaningful and useful in these molecular networks. So, you could think that um, these genes that I painted there um, could, for instance, represent all those genes in which a variation has been found to, to predispose you to develop type 2 diabetes at some point in your life. And what we found is that these different genes that are associated to the same disease, they are not scattered randomly all over the place in these networks, but they, they are associated to very well-defined local neighborhoods. And this is incredibly useful because once you identify there is a certain neighborhood, this helps you to um, search for other genes that may also be important for the same disease. So you can systematically screen your neighborhoods for other processes um, that may be also important. And in fact, the analogy between the internet that I mentioned before and these um, cellular networks goes so far that we do use the same algorithms to rank the genes for their importance to a certain disease that Google uses to rank um, the websites in their importance for a certain um, search that we put in there. And lastly, 
also the notion of distance is meaningful in these molecular networks in that um, the red and the blue disease could correspond, for instance, to diabetes and obesity, so diseases that are strongly related, whereas those that are farther away essentially have nothing to do with the molecular reasons for the disease of the two lower ones. All right, so how does this, how do we apply that um, to actually concrete patients? And we work very closely with geneticists and medical doctors and biologists in, in uh, the department where I work. And one of the challenges that we are trying to tackle is uh, our rare diseases. So rare diseases are defined by being rare, um, but there are so many of them that actually collectively between 10 and 20% of a population are suffering from one rare disease. And the majority of these rare diseases are genetic. That means that there is a certain location in the DNA of these patients, and more often than not, it's actually only a single location where there is a defect or a mutation that is responsible for the disease. The first challenge is that it is often very, very difficult to actually find which location is responsible, because all of us, we have thousands and thousands of small variations in our DNA, if I compare mine with yours, but usually they only account for, um, well, our individuality. Some people are tall, some not so much, some have blue eyes, well, red eyes, uh, dark eyes, brown eyes. And the challenge to find the one red variation in the genome of these um, patients that are usually kids is actually quite difficult. It's really to find the needle in the haystack. And how we use these concepts that I introduced you before is like this. First, we would map all the variations that we find in a given patient onto these networks. So you, we would check which are the genes that they actually belong to. And then we would try to identify um, a neighborhood that actually is a similar disease that we already know. So for example, if we are dealing with patients that have um, severe problems in their immune system, we would check which other diseases we actually know are causing a similar problem in the immune system. So this will give us a hint what is the general neighborhood in which we um, are more likely to find the actual variation that is causing the disease. Now what we have at this point, if we are successful in identifying this, um, this causal variation, is essentially a diagnosis, a molecular diagnosis saying um, the disease in that person is caused by a variation in gene X. And that is already incredibly useful because it helps you understand what the molecular, the, the causal chain of events might be leading from that a letter in your DNA is different all the way up to a problem that manifests in, in organs. But what we ultimately want to achieve is, of course, we want to help these patients. So we would also like to get a therapeutic avenue out of that. And the way we do this is, again, using these neighborhoods. So we would systematically look around the... Um, causal gen genetic variation for other diseases for which we actually know a treatment. So we would check which of these blue circles are very, very close and have a treatment that works, and then we can start a discussion on whether that treatment might also be applicable um, to this newly discovered disease. All right, to, to, to end, um, I would like to look a little bit into the future, because I showed you many pretty pictures, at least I like them. Um, but that is not how our day-to-day -day work really looks like. This is. <laughs> um, and it quite literally is. So this is, um, when I prepared the slide, I went a couple of offices um, down and asked my postdoc, Celine, to make a screenshot of what she was working on right now. So that is literally how we work. That is, we do a lot of math, we do a lot of statistics, and we do a lot of coding. And one of the prime challenges in today's biology and medicine is that we are drowning in data. So, for instance, um, genome sequencing has or is about to become so accessible and so cheap and so easy to do that it is not a stretch to imagine that in a couple of years, sequencing your genome will be as standard practice if you go and see a doctor as today is maybe measuring your blood pressure. The challenge is more what to do with all this data, how to interpret it what it really means. And one part of the answer is certainly this. So one part is powerful computers and uh, machine learning algorithms. But there is a second part, and that is um, us. So that is the human intuition and the human creativity and the human ability to take complex data and complex facts and to try to connect them, relate them with one another, and to make sense out of them. And 
a few years ago or right now there is another technology that is emerging that I think will profoundly change the way that we interact with computers and that is virtual reality. So what we designed, to be specifically what Sebastian, uh, one of our team members designed, is a virtual reality tool to interact with these um, huge and complex data sets. So what you see here is what he actually sees through these um, 3D glasses and he can inspect individual nodes, what kind of protein is that, he can ask the computer, show me the disease neighborhood of disease X, and he can do all of what I showed you before, and a whole bunch of more. So, my vision for how a medical person will actually work in a couple of years, it might very well look like this. So that you go to a doctor and you will see a specialist um, interacting and making sense out of these complex data that all of us have. And to us, this is a tool that would in fact allow us to dive into the complexity and into these massive data. And my, my vision of where this will go is really to, to help no longer be alienated by machine learning and massive data, but to foster a new and I hope very fruitful relationship between um, humans and machines in this very interactive way. And I think it's going to be really cool. Uh, thank you. <laughs>